Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to everyone who's here this morning on this special Christmas Eve morning. Um, we welcome everyone who's joining us here and those who will visit us online later. We're glad for your presence and your joining with us. The focus for our worship service this morning is printed in your bulletin. It says, throughout the biblical story, we often see that the people who are the most ordinary are the ones through whom God chooses to work. In our humility, we sometimes ask, why me? When God invites us to participate, we might just as well ask, why not me? We're so ordinary, will God really work through us? Today, we ponder how God works in ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And so this, this morning's, we're pondering still. This evening, we'll be celebrating Christmas. <laughs> so come this evening, too. So join me in the call to worship, please. And notice there's a place for high voices and low voices. And I'll let each of you decide whether your voice is high or low, depending on what you would like. And I will do the leader part. God sent the angel Gabriel to a young woman in Nazareth named Mary. He said to her, Greetings, favored one. God is with you. By Gabriel's words. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. Like Mary, we're also ordinary. Will God really work through us? Together, we ponder. Let's begin with a song, number 225 in your hymnal, We Come. And Conrad will lead us.
This morning, as we light our peace candle, I'm going to invite Elise, Trish, and Stephen to sing for us. As we see the horror of war and violence around the world displayed on our TVs, phones, and computer screens, we lament the death and destruction. Let us continue to pray that God will grant peace as Elise, Trish, and Stephen sing for us. A song called Dona Nobis Pacem, it means God grant peace. Join me in the litany as printed in your hymn, in your bulletin. As I light the hand. God of peace, Christ of peace, Spirit of peace, you are calling us to be peacemakers. Today. And now we'd like to invite the children to come forward. And Beth will have something for them. And Greg. And Greg. Okay. Okay, if the children would come up, please. <coughs> yeah, you can I'll sit down right down. here. We're so glad to see you all. Yeah. Anyway, when you want to come see. Hmm. Well, hi, everyone. Just a second. Oh, Greg and I are enjoying our pretzels and M&Ms. Well, sweet petunia, you don't put your M&M on top of your head. Wow. Aren't these good? Oh, they're really good. Well, oh. Look at these kids. Should we share? Maybe with one. Oh, don't give too much. Don't give too much. Okay. One a little bit. Yeah, it's just one one M and M. Hi. Yeah. Oh, look at the rest of them. Nobody seems very happy. How do you feel about us eating right in front of you? I guess. Well, first, what? how do you feel? What do you think of someone eating food in, right in front of you? Mmm. It, it's jealous. delicious for us. Oh, he feels jealous. Oh, jealous. No, it's, oh, yeah. It's, it's not fair, is it? I guess it isn't fair or just. We should all be sharing what we have. We shouldn't leave anybody out. When we don't share, it's called injustice. Oh, injustice is hard. And the time before Jesus was born was hard, too. 
the government was greedy and took the little money or property that the poor people had. It wasn't fair. In today's sermon, a teenage girl, Mary, was visited by an angel of God. And the angel told her she would have a baby, and the baby would be a long-awaited king. This girl, named Mary, was just a regular person, just like you and me. But God worked out something extraordinary for the whole world through ordinary Mary. Jesus would be born and would bring fairness and love to all. She even made up a song. She said, God will fill the hungry with good things, and the rich will be sent away empty. You know, things in life just aren't fair or just, but God can work through ordinary people like you and me to bring God's kingdom on earth, a place where everyone has enough and is treated equally. God's love is big enough for us all, and that is extraordinary. Let's talk to God. God, help us show your love through ordinary people like us, young and old and in between. Bless all these children and thank you for the gift of your son Jesus who brought justice to everyone. Amen. Look, no, look at those faces. Oh. I think we should probably, sh that we will want to share our pretzels and M&Ms. Yeah, well, me too. Me too, but... You won't get them until at the end of church, and they'll be back at the table there for you, okay? Um, no. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, if there's some left, okay? All right, thank you for coming up. Okay. It was a question. It's okay. Thank you. It's time for our scripture readings. And I'll go first so that Beth can get herself <laughs> together. Um, the first, there's two scripture readings this morning from Psalm 89 and from Luke 1. And Psalm 89, 1 to 4, says this. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth, I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant, David. I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. And Luke 1, 26 to 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin, engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who is said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. And Beth will read in Spanish. 
For those who are visiting, we like to read in English and then a language that some of us would speak. So I'll read Spanish. <clears throat> es Lucas 1, versos 26 a 38. A los seis meses, Dios envió al ángel Gabriel a Nazaret, pueblo de Galilea, a visitar a una joven virgen comprometida para casarse con un hombre que se llamaba José, descendiente de David. La virgen se llamaba María. El ángel se acercó a ella y le dijo, Te saludo, tú que has recibido el favor de Dios. El Señor está contigo. Ante estas palabras, María se perturbó y se preguntaba qué podría significar este saludo. No tengas miedo, María. Dios te ha concedido su favor, le dijo el ángel. Cararás embarazada y darás a luz un hijo y le pondrás por nombre Jesús. Él será un gran hombre y lo llamarán Hijo de Altísimo. Dios el Señor le dará el trono de su padre David y reinará sobre el pueblo de Jacob para siempre. Su reinado no tendrá fin. ¿Cómo podrá suceder esto? Preguntó María al ángel. Pues yo que soy virgen. Y el ángel dijo, el Espíritu Santo vendrá sobre ti y el poder del Altísimo te cubrirá con su sombra. Así que al santo niño que va a nacer lo llamarán hijo de Dios. También tu parienta Elizabeth va a tener un hijo en su vejez. De hecho, la que decían que era estéril ya está en el sexto mes de embarazo. Porque para Dios no hay nada imposible. Aquí tienes a la sierva del Señor, contestó María, que él haga conmigo como me has dicho. Con esto, el ángel le dijo. Esta es la palabra del Señor, gracias a Dios. We're in this songbook, page 11. If you look at the bottom of the page, you'll see the text comes from John Bell. About 40 years ago, a young man was a part of a church, and he was really discouraged with how the Church of England was singing. And he said, I'm going to do what I can to revitalize music and make it more accessible, enjoyable. John Bell is that person and uh, led as part of the Iona community, which some of us uh, maybe have had direct contact with on pilgrimages or visits into Scotland. My wife keeps saying, we got to go over there, Conrad. I went there once, and she wants to take me back, and I keep saying, okay, okay, we'll go, but um, someday. <laughs>
I now invite Tiana and Marcella to come and do our drama for us. I can't believe I was chosen for this. I totally know why I was chosen for this. I mean, come on, I'm just an ordinary person, nothing special. Why wouldn't they choose me? I'm extraordinary. I get up, go to school, treat people the way I want to be treated, come home, eat dinner, go to bed, the same as everyone else. Even the most ordinary of daily tasks goes within my extraordinariness. People are better for having been in my presence. Just why would anyone think I am the best person for this? Bring it on. Couldn't find a better person than me to crush it. I mean, carrying God's plan to save the world seems a bit lofty. And again, I'm nothing but an extra I'm nothing but an ordinary creature. Look at me carrying God's plan for humanity. But of course, and don't be afraid. Of course I'm afraid. <clears throat> But actually, the don't be afraid part has, has me a bit shooken. And yet, it sounds so wonderful, scattering the proud, bringing down the powerful, lifting the lowly. God's actions seem more extraordinary than mine. Feeding the hungry, sending the rich away empty, God's promises filled, those are things I can get excited about. Mm, maybe I could tone down my extraordinaries a bit. <laughs> if God's about lifting the lowly, maybe I should, should rethink what I have to offer. What if I'm not the right person? What if it's not me? What if I am the right person? What if it's me? What, what if being extraordinary, ordinary is God's plan? Nothing is impossible with God. Thank you for sharing with us. And Pratik, we invite you to come forward. May God bless you as you bring the message to us. Tiana and Marcella, you both did a great job. Who, uh, what's the name again? Uh, Marcella, yes, Marcella, you did a great job. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful to see all uh, you wonderful people. Uh, we have uh, smiles on our faces. We are celebrating this time with our families. Uh, we are having our family members at home, and we all are enjoying this wonderful time together, and we give God the praise and glory for giving us this opportunity to celebrate Christmas once again, a time when we all as a family rejoice uh, as a church and also as a family, where we remind ourselves of the great joy that came to the world, where Jesus was born into this world, to Mother Mary. And we all were saved through his grace. So let us all celebrate this time and let us uh, look to the Lord in prayer and ask the Lord to bless this message and bless all of us as we listen to this. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, we come to your presence this morning and we are so thankful to you, so grateful to you for your presence, O oh Lord. We thank you once again for coming down into this earth, O oh Lord, for all of us, to save us. You were born as a little child. You were put in a manger. You humbled yourself. You emptied yourself. And you have saved our life, O oh Lord. We thank you that you died on the cross. We thank you for your birth. We thank you for your resurrection. We thank you for everything that you have done in our lives, especially this time as we listen to your word and as we remind ourselves of the story that happened, O oh Lord, the story when we hear about your coming into this world. We pray that you please bless all of us. Bless this message. Make it a blessing to me and to all of us. In Jesus' mighty, precious name, we pray. Amen. Last few weeks have been really filled with a lot of surprises for me. Beautiful surprises. Almost every day when I came to the office, I found either a greeting card or a token of love, a small gift from our church family. And it was really awesome to receive them. Every single uh, card 
is valued. And I really want to thank each and every one of you uh, who have greeted me or sent a card or, or given any kind of gift. On one particular morning when I was driving to the church, I was meditating on this passage of Luke, Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 38. And I knew that I'm going to preach on the 24th. So this, this sermon was in my mind, this passage was in my mind, and I was just pondering upon this passage. And I was coming, I was thinking maybe I will read some resources, some commentary, uh, maybe we'll be having some here in the library and I will go and I will look at it. And I opened the door and I found that there is a commentary, a brand new commentary on Luke sitting on my table. I didn't know that if I wish something, it will happen that day. <laughs> Otherwise, there were, there were other things also that I could have wished. But that was a brand new book written by Mary Schertz, a renounced professor from AMBS. And uh, she had a, a small note in that, say, on that, saying that, uh, uh, may the Lord bless you. And she had uh, given that book to me. And thank you, Beth, for bringing that to me. It was, it was really a blessing. A good book that I'm really enjoying reading. Now, all of us who have families or who have friends, we all receive greetings. We receive greeting cards, we receive gifts from our family members, and we really enjoy it this season. And those gifts, those cards, those, uh, those uh, token of love, you know, they make us smile for a while. We, for a, for a moment, we just forget about all the worries, all the stress, all the struggles that we are going through in our daily lives. For a moment, you know, just you read the card and you just forget about everything else. But eventually, maybe when your family members are gone, or maybe after a while, when you are cooking, you realize that, oh, my back still acts. Oh, my goodness, you know. Or you're standing and trying to uh, make some pie, or just heating up the, uh, the apple cider and you realize that, oh my goodness, you know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm again having that pain in my body. Some greetings, some good things happens and it is very, for, for a very little time, momentary. But here something is happening in a little girl's life, uh, a woman, uh, a virgin's life, a daughter of God. A person who received a greeting that is so unusual. This Christmas greeting from the angel Gabriel is so profound that uh, if Mary takes it positively, it will change her life and it will change the course of human history forever. It was such a message that uh, Mary is going to receive from Gabriel. However, I'm not sure if Mary wanted this greeting in her life. What do you think? She was not prepared for it. If you read verse 29, it says, it, it makes it clear that Mary was greatly troubled, greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greetings this might be. What kind of greeting this might be. Yet, she sets a good example for all of us to respond as ordinary people who are receiving extraordinary jobs from the Lord. This morning, uh, very quickly, I want to share just three things that we can learn from the life of Mary, basically from her response to God's call or God's invitation. The very first thing is Mary knew that God works through ordinary people. And I think this is a truth that all of us should always know that God uses ordinary people because in God's eye, there is no extraordinary human being. Whether it is Herod, he is still a human being, or it is Joseph, or Mary, all of them. So when God was looking in the world, he was looking all the ordinary people. There was no extraordinary person. And that's why God chose Mary, who was certainly somebody uh, whom God liked. When I pondered on the topic of today's sermon, why me or why not me, in Luke's passage, we find that... Uh, uh, Something is happening in uh, Mary's life. When she receives this greeting, she's not asking the angel, why me or why not me? Rather, how is this going to happen? How is this going to happen? 
right? That is the confusion or that is the, the concern that Mary was having. She knew probably that God has always worked in the life of ordinary people. Abraham was ordinary person. Moses was ordinary. And she looks back to the history that God has always used the ordinary people. But when God is now choosing me, how is that going to happen? And I think that is a very good word for all of us. A good reminder for all of us. How is that going to happen is something that we need to ask the Lord. Rather than why me or why not me. Because he chooses ordinary people. The scripture shows us over and over again that God uses regular, ordinary people to accomplish great things. Mary, Joseph, Elizabeth, Zechariah were all ordinary people. Young and old people going about their normal lives when God chose them to be part of the greatest story of human history. God works with and through ordinary people to show the world that all people are loved and matter, not just those with worldly power and influence. And today, when I see the turmoil that the world is experiencing, I feel like God is calling every ordinary people, every individual to listen to him and to act and make a difference. But only a few are responding positively, you know. I, I, I'm always reminded of Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 6, 8. And when he heard the call from the Lord, who will go, whom shall I send? He was the person who said, I will go, here I am, send me. And I think that is the kind of response God wants from all his people in the world who say that we know the Lord, that we may stand up and say that we are going to go, we are going to be the mediator, we are going to pray for peace, and, uh, and uh, we can pray for justice in the world. Secondly, Mary takes responsibility to accomplish God's plan. Mary takes responsibility to accomplish God's plan. The Bible says that Mary was favored by God. Favored by God. But being favored by God did not automatically delete all her worries, all her problems, all her pain or suffering or all her fears. But it gave Mary the confidence that God is with her and that God approves her life and her actions. God approves her life and her actions. For most people, that is where we want to get to. We just want to get to a place where God will be happy with us. If he is happy with us, he is okay with us, I think that's what we need. We don't need to worry about other people or we don't need to do anything for the Lord uh, or anybody else in our lives. Here we see that God is a God who loves all people and when he was choosing Mary, he is using her to bless the generations. Those who are chosen by God are also expected to minister to God and to people. I have the least doubt in the fact that Mary had the option to say no. And I think that is a very important thing that I learned. That Mary could have said no. She had that option. We might think that, okay, if the angel came to Mary, she has to say yes. That's not true. I think she still could have said no. And all of us can say yes or no. It is up to us. The greeting of the angel did not bring a sudden joy in Mary's life. She was threatened. She was scared. As Mary Schertz in her commentary, she mentions that initial confusion and uncertainty in the face of the uh, epiphany are normal responses in the biblical text, as well as in human experience. God's visitation catches Mary amid ordinary life. While we may never know the reason for her inner disturbance, she would have known from her tradition that those singled out by God are not always favored in the ways that are understandable. She was surely familiar with the stories of Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Moses, Joseph, and others in the Bible. And now she is standing in the long line of those who are favored by God whose life were exciting but not problem-free. 
And now she thinks that now I am going to be part of that list. I see Mary as an evangelist to the whole world who was carrying the gospel in her womb. Mary took the responsibility on behalf of all humankind so that all of us may be blessed through her obedience. Henry Norman, in his book, Letter to Mark about Jesus, he talks about the uh, descending way of Jesus. And he says, it isn't easy really to feel and understand from the inside the descending way of Jesus, which means the way he came down to the earth as he was in the manger, he had human parents, and he completely humbled himself. As Paul says in Philippians 2.7, that Jesus made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And further, Henry says that every fiber of our being rebels against it. We don't want to be like that. Then further, he says, we don't mind praying, uh, paying attention to the poor people, from time to time, but descending to a state of poverty and becoming poor with the poor, that we don't want to do. And yet, this is the way Jesus chose as the way to know God. We talk, all talk about carrying Jesus in our lives. And it is a call to be like Mary, who was really literally carrying Jesus in her womb, what it meant to carry Jesus in the womb, uh, womb is that it included insults. It included suffering. It included failures. It included pain and sorrow. Even the loss of his, her dear ones. Eventually, Jesus is going to die. And she will experience that. But what uh, but the amazing favor and peace of God makes the journey possible. And that is the exciting part. Thirdly, Mary constantly trusted in God's faithfulness even in odd situations. Mary constantly trusted in God's faithfulness even in odd situations. For Mary to see Jesus as the Messiah, if you read the word or the word was read to us, it said that he will be like his father David and his kingdom will never end. Can you imagine the angel had said to Mary, and Mary must have been pondering, so everything that happened in the life of Jesus, she was always keeping that in her memory. She had that in her mind. Even when Jesus, when he was 12, he goes to the temple, and he had uh, that conversation with her mother and the parents, like when they were amazed to see that he's talking to the teachers of the law and arguing with them in a way, or answering them in a way, they were amazed, and they say, why did you leave us, and uh, you are alone here? Then, whatever response Jesus is giving here, Mary kept that in the mind, in, in her mind. That I have to be in my father's house. Don't you know that I have to be in my father's house? Mary kept that in her mind. And I'm very sure that Mary had this in her mind, that he is going to be a king. And his kingdom is never going to end. And maybe she was waiting every single year, that maybe this year something might happen. 30 long years, so first nine months she was pregnant, then Jesus is born, then another 30 years, and some scholars believe that he started his ministry at the age of 31. So when he started the ministry, probably Mary was thinking, now he's going to become the king, and I'm going to see that kingdom that is never going to end. 32, 33, and finally, she finds that somebody has arrested Jesus. And now, maybe she thought, now he'll be freed, but no. They put him on the cross, and he died. But Mary trusted the promise of God. She was faithful. If you see her life, she remained faithful that whatever God has promised, he is going to do. Just compare this story with the life of Abraham. When Abraham was going to sacrifice his son Isaac, that time God actually stopped. Maybe Mary that time remembered that God stopped Abraham from hurting his child. Maybe God will stop the scene at the cross and maybe save my child. And then maybe my child will become the Messiah, the King. 
and this kingdom will not end. But no, he died on the cross. But to God be the glory, Jesus rose again. And I think maybe she was the happiest person that time. Then she understood what actually the plan of God was. It was a mystery even to Mary, even though she was carrying Jesus in the womb. And sometimes when we see everything that is happening around us, it is hard for us to imagine how is God going to bring peace? How is God going to bring hope in this kind of situation? It is just impossible. But after the death, Jesus can bring resurrection. He can bring life. Her journey was not easy. Just to give an example here, she received that word from the angel, but further on, it was not a smooth journey. If you read Matthew chapter 2, verse 13, now when they departed, the Magi, they departed after visiting Jesus, after giving the gifts, they went back. And the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, and he said, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and escape to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to kill him. Herod is seeking to kill all the young child. And as the word says, that when many young children were, were killed, and there was weeping, there was weeping all over that place. And just imagine, thus far, whatever the decree was that Herod had made, it came to pass, isn't it? He was the king. Whatever he said, it happened. And this time also, if he is determined to find that little child, he could have found that little child. Can you imagine the fear of Mary? She knew that hey, Herod wanted to do this. He was able to do that. And now maybe he wants my child. What if he sends some spy and knows where my child is? Every single day, maybe she was threatened. She was threatened. She was afraid. Yet, Mary and Joseph, they trusted God. Mary's story is the greatest example of human involvement in accomplishing God's work. God had been choosing people for his work, from Abraham to David, and from prophet Isaiah to John the Baptist. There are examples after examples in the Bible where we can see God used just common people to accomplish his tasks. Today, even when we are celebrating Christmas, I believe that in every house we will have at least one conversation where we will talk about what is happening in the world today. The weeping that is happening all across, all over the place, our neighbors, our, our neighboring countries where there is weeping going on, where there is crying going on, and we are the ones who are carrying the Christ in our womb, in our heart, in our lives. And maybe it may seem like, oh, it's, everything is like hopeless. Maybe there is no hope. But Jesus surely is going to bring hope, even in this Christmas. And he is at work. I see that in the experience of Mary, she was continuously, she was, she was becoming uh, mature in her faith and in her discipleship. She was learning to be trusting in God every single time. Every experience helped her to become closer and closer to God. She was the one when, he, when she was first was afraid and slowly she came to a position where she was able to glorify God. You remember the song of Mary, right? Where she glorified God for what he has done in her life. But slowly she learned that after Jesus died on the cross, she learned that God's plan is even greater than just blessing her or blessing one nation, but blessing the whole world. That's what Christmas is all about. That Jesus has come. That we have hope. That we have peace that we have love. Even today, God is calling ordinary people like you and me from all ages to be transformed in the way of Christ and be ready to bless our own generation by responding to the invitation of God. As Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. May his word be fulfilled. May that word be fulfilled in our lives as well. Amen.
As we enter this song, page 229, it may not be familiar, but think about a place where you have been given something that was sort of shocking news, but then later you ponder it and wondering, making sense of what God was doing. It's a melody that may not, I, I don't know how familiar it is with this church, but I want to just express my appreciation to Chris. Send him some music this week. And I thought he's going to blow it back and say, no, I, that's the wrong key. He's playing in five sharps today. And I, it's the first time in my life as a pastor or as a church member to have somebody just say, oh, yeah, I'll do it. Five sharps. And, uh, yeah, this is wonderful. And uh, it's been a, are we okay? Yeah, t t take your time there. So I better talk some more. Our pianist just has a contact rolling in the wrong place. That'll make her four sharps harder. Um, while she's getting back, I would like to draw your attention to another place in the music. If you watch the words unexpected and mysterious, in the music you see a vertical line. That means don't keep counting the beat. Don't keep going on. Take a little pause. Okay, you'll see those throughout the melody about maybe four times. I didn't count them. I see them at least three times. But this melody can't push on like a march beat. This is not joy to the world. Oh, come all you faithful. Boom, boom, boom. It's take time to breathe and allow the mystery to settle in. Did I stall long enough, Beth? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Take your time. And here we go. Oh. 
I wish you all a very Merry Christmas. I think it's happening and uh, we all are in that uh, joy. Uh, this is the time for all of us to share and pray together. Let us uh, share in testimony and sharing. If you have anything that you would like to share with all of us today, please take this moment. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very 